Um, so today is 9-19. So what is science? It's a way of thinking about the world. And I would argue that the world in general, outs inside and outside of the sciences, could use a little bit more scientific thinking. Um, science is about things being measurable and provable, and there being evidence, and you being able to cite evidence. And it's a way of thinking about things systemically, and you have all employed scientific thinking at some point in your lives. I can guarantee it. You have solved some problem in your home, in your personal life, in your, huh, I don't have sugar and I'm making chocolate chip cookies. You know, you, you, you have done some sort of problem solving somewhere that has employed a scientific way of thinking. So, um, I, I think certainly in my lifetime there's, there's been this weird, I hear some people call it a move away from scientific thinking um, in the U.S. And I, I don't quite understand why, but I want to talk about what science really is. And I am not, absolutely not, going to do the cookbook scientific method with you because I think it's stupid and I think it's insulting to you. And I think if you were in third grade, it would be a fantastic thing to do. But we're not going to do that. We're going to talk a little bit more in sort of real terms about what science is and isn't. And this is one that I, I got years and years and years ago at a, um, it was a one-week science teacher, two-week, two-week, science teacher workshop that I went to that addressed one of, one of the topics was sort of, you know, describing science to students and helping students understand what science is and isn't, what science can and can't do. Because science can't do everything. There, it is it's a fabulous way to understand the world. It's a fabulous way to think about the world. It's a fabulous way to problem solve. But it doesn't answer all the questions. There are questions that are outside the realm of science, and that's fine, too. There are, there are different ways to answer different questions about the world. So, in order to differentiate science from other ways of understanding the world, because there are other ways to understand the world, CONPIT was the acronym they used. I haven't decided yet. I've been using the CONPIT thing for I don't know how many years. I haven't decided yet whether or not I think it's stupid. Um, maybe this is the last year I use CONPIT. I don't know. What I do like is that if you, if you use that acronym, what it gives you are some, some sort of things to hang meaning on. So science is consistent. This is an acronym. It has to be consistent with the way that other things we know about work. Um, we can't say, well, they got this result in their lab, and in their lab, molecules behave this way, but in my lab, they behave a completely different way. Um, they, they also did a great thing on <coughs> pseudoscience. And there's, there's a whole lot of pseudoscience, and it's used to sell you stuff. And it's, it's used to sell people who don't have a good way of thinking about the world stuff. If we're going to claim that something is a scientific explanation, it has to be consistent with the way that other things that we're aware of work. There has to be good evidence for it. Um, I, I, will, I will tell you one thing. All through college, I worked at a health food store, a um, little co-op in Youngstown many, many years ago. This was long before there was organic produce at Giant Eagle. This was long before a lot of stuff. It was a different world. You couldn't get soy milk outside of a health food store. You couldn't get, you know, I mean... You don't get that world because there's always been soy milk on the shelf at the grocery store. Um, very specialty item in those days. And there were, you know, some, some wonderful, wonderful people. And then there were, well, let's see, how would we put it politely? Some whack jobs. And, and, and some real dubious claims being made by people who were out to make a buck. My favorite was the... Special oxygen water being sold. Eight dollars a gallon. Eight bucks a gallon. If you actually and I think it came in smaller containers, so it worked out to be even more than that. And it was special oxygen water. And it contained something like eighty-eight percent oxygen by mass, which is exactly the percentage by mass of oxygen in the compound H2O. People bought this stuff. 
Now, the, the store that I worked at, we didn't tend to sell that kind of stuff. Our manager was pretty good about sort of evaluating claims. Um, there was another health food store downtown that had every crazy whack job kind of sales pitch, hardcore, madhouse stuff you could ask for. People didn't see that that was just a load of crap. And I, I'm kind of offended by that on a, on a personal, moral, ethical, philosophical basis. Like, I want you be, to be able to think better than that. So when we look at something that we claim, someone is claiming is science, it has to be consistent with everything else we know. You can't look at anything in a vacuum. You can't look at anything in isolation. You have to look at it in the body of other scientific facts. It has to be observable. Um, we, we, can't, we can't make scientific claims about something that we can't either observe the phenomena itself or evidence of the phenomena. Um, the one that always pops up, because we do a little bit with this in, in biology, is, well, you know, the history of the Earth. How do you know the Earth is 4.6 billion years old? Well, can you see it? No. Were there humans there to observe it? No. But we can look at evidence of events in a way that's consistent with the other things we know scientifically. We can look at radioactive decay of rocks. We can look at the age of rocks obtained from the moon. And we can piece together evidence that is from our senses, that are, is observable, that allows us to draw a conclusion. And if we're going to say it's scientific, it can't invoke a supernatural explanation. Super, supernatural explanations are fine. Um, but we can't invoke one and call it science because magical elves did it. Nope, doesn't work. Um, because God did it. Doesn't work for a scientific explanation. That's a different way of seeing the world and it's a valid way of seeing the world. But it's different. And I'll actually, on, on the supernatural one, I'll mention the tea kettle. And I spend a lot more time on the tea kettle in biology but I'll mention this. So, I have my tea kettle up there. In biology, I actually fill the thing with water, stick it on a burner, and just let it go until it does its thing. You walk into a kitchen, there's a tea kettle sitting on the stove, whistling. I'm going to give you two explanations. You tell me if they're valid. So, my first explanation, and this would be a scientific explanation, is that as heat is applied to the tea kettle, the kettle is made of metal. Metal is a good conductor of heat. That heat is conducted into the water inside. The water molecules move faster and faster. They spread apart. As they spread apart, they're forced out through a small opening. Them passing over a little membrane in that opening causes it to vibrate, and we hear a whistle. Is that a reasonable explanation? Yeah. Now, here's another explanation for you. My friend Elaine walked into the kitchen about 15 minutes ago, turned the burner on, walked out, and forgot about it. Is that also a reasonable explanation? Could it also be true? Yeah. In science, we don't care who turned the tea kettle on. We can't address who turned the tea kettle on in science. We can only look at the observable data. These are not mutually exclusive. You can have strong and powerful beliefs about who turned the tea kettle on and still be trying to figure out why the thing is whistling. Okay. It's a good metaphor. I, I, I heard that years ago, and I really like it. It's got to allow us to predict. This is the big strength in science, is it allows us to generalize from a set of observations. So we watch how something unfolds in one instance. And if we're doing this scientifically, it allows us to say, well, if this is happening the way I believe it is, then when we do this, that's what's going to happen. And that's incredibly powerful, that predictive ability. Um, if it's science, it's testable. Science is testable. We can make a prediction. We support or don't support the hypothesis um, based on the results of our testing. And a word about the word theories. Is a theory a little thing or a big thing? And if you're like, uh -huh, you know what, I got a theory about tonight. I think we're going to order pizza. 
In a scientific sense, a theory is heavy duty. Theory is not a hunch. Theory is not um, flimsy. In a scientific sense, there are a lot of things that we've known about for a lot of years that are still considered hypotheses um, because it takes multiple, multiple, multiple tests of hypotheses being supported with really nothing um, that doesn't support the hypothesis before you get to the point where you call it a theory. So in biology, of course, the unifying theory is the theory of um, evolution by natural selection. There hasn't been a single observation that has undermined that. So it's a theory. It's very strong. Um, we could also talk about the word law here. Laws don't explain anything. They're a little bit different than theories. So theories seek to explain a phenomena. Laws just describe it. Okay. And hypotheses are working explanations. Okay, science changes. It's tentative. It changes on a fairly regular basis. I'm trying to think what groundbreaking things um, we've seen in the last decade. Well, plasmid mediated antibiotic resistance in biology. What? We're talking about antibiotic resistance in biology right now. I'm doing a unit on it with them. Um, bacteria reproduce asexually. So, for a long time, it wasn't really understood that they can transfer little tiny bits of DNA even across species. That's terrifying. Um, it's called plasmid mediated resistance. Plasmid mediated resistance. And so they pass these little chunks that are like a cheat sheet for the antibiotic to other bacteria. It's sort of pseudo-sexual <laughs> exchange of genetic information. That wasn't known when I was a high school student. Um, we knew that there was something called bacterial conjugation, but I don't think that anybody knew about something like plasma-mediated resistance. Um, in chemistry, what big, crazy changes have there been? Okay, noble gases discovered in what, 18... 97, something like that, early, either early 20th or late 19th century. They don't form compounds, period. Well, in the last 10 years, we have found three compounds with noble gases in them. But that can't happen. Well, science is tentative. Um, <laughs> there, was a, there was a time when it was believed that there, there was no unit smaller than the atom. And you're going to do a whole um, bunch of work on the history of atomic theory. And that was believed for a very long time. And then suddenly we had people who discovered, no, the atom is actually comprised of smaller pieces. There are smaller pieces than the atom. The atom can be divided. So science is tentative. It changes. And what we've got at any one point, science is absolutely positively not a collection of facts. Now, there are a bunch of facts associated with science. And you've memorized a lot of them over the course of your lifetime. It's like learning the alphabet. Um, and, and the average high schooler with a pretty solid science background can probably sing the ABC song. Maybe. Depends on which branch of science we're talking about. Um, those are just the pieces that make up the language of science. And they're small pieces. But it does change. The sentences and the paragraphs and the novels change. Some of the, some of the alphabet letters change. <laughs> but not as often. But how we understand those things to go together do change. Um, and we keep learning more. There's, if, if you're interested in science, I would strongly suggest um, sciencedaily.com. It's, it's one of my favorite websites, and they do um, summaries of current scientific research across fields. They do psychology, sociology, biology, chemistry, physics, math, um, computer stuff, environmental science. And it's nice because they do these little sort of very short summaries of actual scientific work. Generally, it takes me until my year calms down a little bit before I can start checking Science Daily every day. But I, I like to read it every day because there's good stuff. Um, people are finding new things. Okay. This is as close as we're going to get to the cookbook method. Um, how many of you had to, at some point memorized the steps of the scientific method? Of course you did, because that's what we do. And you know what? It's fine for little kids. It's not okay for you guys. 
because science is really a set of methods. It's not a single method. It is more than anything else a way of thinking about things. It's a way of thinking about the world. It's a way of asking questions. Um, every time you hear someone make a political claim, which we're hearing a lot of right now, the first words out of your mouth or out of your brain should be, what is your evidence? Show me your data. What is your evidence? Show me your data. That's a scientific way of approaching the world. And, and scientists tend to be skeptical. <laughs> and you should be too. Skepticism is a good thing. So it is a set of tools that's useful. It's useful for understanding natural phenomena. Again, we cannot understand the supernatural with science. It's not the realm of science. Um, in general, science starts with observations. Um, and this is a good, again, this is a good life skill. It's good to be observant about the world around you. Period. It's good to notice things. Um, we'll talk more as we go. You guys did a good job making some observations in some of your labs. Um, very carefully noting detail and noting all of the factual detail you can. Um, asking questions. Asking why you're seeing what you're seeing. Huh, well that turned a really dark blue when we heated it, but this one didn't. What's the difference between these two? Asking questions. Um, collecting data, noting everything you can, um, keeping good detailed records, and forming hypotheses. What is a hypothesis? Educated. Educated guess. That's the definition I was waiting for. I hate that definition. Uh, sorry, that's, that felt like a trap, I'm sure. But that's what every single student who gets to chemistry says. A hypothesis is an educated guess. No, it's not. And that's, you know what, again, that's what you've been taught. And it's fine when you're younger, you're older now. A hypothesis is a working explanation. It is the best explanation we have at present for how something works. That is a hypothesis. So you will hear scientists talk about, well, the leading hypothesis for blah, 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 blah. Um, oh, things we didn't know 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Viruses can cause cancer. What? We had no idea. And it, and it appears, now cervical cancer, you know, is linked to the HPV virus. Um, it appears that there are other viruses that are linked to what's called oncogenesis, the beginnings of cancer, triggering changes in cells in the body that lead those cells to basically lose their minds and continue to reproduce unchecked. It appears that there's more than one case where a virus can interact with the body's cellular mechanism to produce cancer. That's the, lead, that's the hypothesis anyway. The hypothesis is that in certain cancers, viruses play a role. That's not a theory. It's still a hypothesis. It takes a long time, a lot of observations before we can say something is a theory. Um, so they taught, I think, and I, I would have to look up exactly how it's typically expressed. I think it's the, the viral oncogenesis hypothesis, but saying that, you know, this is the working explanation we've got. Um, we tend in science to experiment. We tend to prefer things that have a control, which it means we've got something that's not getting any treatment. In chemistry, we don't use control groups as much as we do in biology. Um, we, well, we do in, hey, look this head up. Um, we do a lot in pharmaceuticals. Um, has anybody here ever been part of a pharmaceutical trial? Okay. Um, when you go to college, if you're um, at a school that has a research hospital, like if you go to the University of Pittsburgh, if you go to someplace in Cleveland, or any, pretty much any place in a major city where there are research hospitals nearby, they're always looking for healthy volunteers ages 18 to 35, and they'll pay you 50 bucks to come in and talk to them in the office for 15 minutes. And college students are easy, easy fodder for that because what college student doesn't need 50 bucks for 15 minutes worth of filling out a health questionnaire? Um, and actually, when I was pregnant with my daughter, um, I participated in a study. I was, I was part of a, a massive research data collection. They had like, I don't know, 10,000 women, all first-time pregnancies. Um, and you had to fill out questionnaires about you know, your diet, what you ate in the three months before the child was conceived. You had to fill out a, a monthly sort of, you know, summary of diet, and they were looking at outcomes. So they were looking for correlations and data. Now, 
did they have a control group? Did they have like second time mothers or women who were not pregnant? Well, you can't do pregnancy outcomes in women who are not pregnant. But can you look at um, a control group who doesn't eat bacon? Sure. Um, you can look at a group that doesn't get some experimental factor. And then whatever, whatever, however, whatever your hypothesis, however you test your hypothesis, the whole point is to be able to draw some kind of conclusion from the data. Data is objective. Numbers are objective. Conclusions are frankly not. The minute you step away from pure data, you are imposing your own biases. And none of us can avoid that. The best you can do in life, in science, and anything else is to recognize your own biases because we all have them. We all come to the table with our own biases. Biases, biases. One of those funky words for plurals. Anyway, the best you can do is recognize them. So that when they do pop up, you know, oh yeah, well, you know, that's my bias. And I, I will very often say just in life, well, you know, I realize that I am biased, however, this is what I think I'm seeing. Which means I'm acknowledging my bias. And it allows you to draw conclusions that recognize those facts. That's all we're going to do about scientific method. Now we're going to get to the math. Are you ready? Okay, scientific notation. How many of you have done this in math? Should be all of you at this point. You have not done this in math? You have no arms? Oh, I, I didn't know we were supposed to raise your hand. Yeah. Your yes. Okay. You should have all done some scientific notation in math. You are going to use it extensively in chemistry this year. You're going to get good at it. So, if it has been a little bugaboo for you, now is the time that we're going to fix that. You're going to get practice. You're going to take a FIP quiz. And this will become, here's, here's what this is. Chemistry is a ladder that you are building right now. Um, you cannot fall behind in chemistry. Not if you want to survive. I mean, you can fall behind, but you're going to drown. Um, chemistry is really easy when taken in 8-ounce glasses. It's really hard taken bucket at a 5-gallon bucket at a time. So the 8-ounce glass is 20 minutes of chemistry practice every day. <laughs> The five-gallon bucket is not doing any of the practice problems and then trying to study the night before the test. When I say it's a ladder, I'm going to give you some practice on this. I'm going to give you a quiz on this. Your Chapter 2 test will include some work with scientific notation. And then I'm not going to test you on scientific notation again, but you're going to have chemistry problems that require you to understand how to use scientific notation. And if you can't do this, then you fail those problems. So... I won't explicitly test you on this again, but your mastery of this will determine your ability to master the next kinds of problems that we do. So it is really important to practice this stuff. And if you're already a rock star at scientific notation, good. Help a buddy. So you know that it's a way to make writing and handling very large and very small numbers much, much easier. So we can take all those zeros and make them go away. And that's fantastic. And I will admit right here, right now, that I cannot readily differentiate left from right. I can do calculus. I can tell north, south, east, and west. I can't tell left from right. So I apologize in advance. I used to try to go say things like move the decimal place to the right, move it to the left, blah, blah, blah. And I would screw up. And then I've got students going, I don't know what you mean, because I would say multiple things because it doesn't mean anything to me. So I tend to say in front of the decimal place and behind the decimal place. That is the convention that I use because I'm too stupid to know left from right. In front of the decimal, behind the decimal. Does that work for everybody? Okay. If we have a number like this, well, let's do that. And we are making a very large number manageable and small. So we're taking the decimal from here, and we're moving it one, two, three, four. We've moved it four places. We're making a larger number, seemingly smaller and more manageable. This becomes 7.2 times 10 to the fourth. You can all do that. You all know how to do that. Everybody always says, like, on a scale of zero to five, I'm a five on this, give me the test now. Good. If I give you a very small number, 
and we're making this very, very tiny number more manageable. So we're going one, two, three, four. Great. In this case, the exponent is negative, 7.2 times 10 to the negative fourth. And of course, the algebra reasoning behind this is because what you're really saying here is you're multiplying 7.2 by 10,000. Here, you're dividing 7,000, or you're dividing 7.2 by 10,000. That's all that negative means, is that it's a fractional um, power of 10. Good? Okay. None of you would screw this up. Here's what you would screw up, and I can tell you this because of eight years of teaching chemistry and the smartest kid in the room who's like, I know scientific notation, okay? I'm like, mm, great, good, so do I. I screw this up too. <laughs> so I'm going to give you um, Moser's puny-brained tricks for not allowing yourself to fall into the giant pothole that exists right in the middle of scientific notation. Because here's the other thing you need to understand. In scientific notation, there is only one form, and that form is this. That form is x point whatever times 10 to the whatever. What that means is that you can only have one number here. In order for it to be correct scientific notation, you cannot give me 11.3 times 10 to the fourth. That's wrong. That is not correct scientific notation. I will mark it wrong. So you have to have one number here, and that one number has to be between 1 and 9. Obviously, you can't, you can't have a 0 there. One number rules 12 right out. Okay? Has to be that way. You can have as many things after that decimal as are appropriate to your significant figures. And we'll talk more about those in the following week. And this, of course, that can be anything. We can have, we'll be dealing very soon with um, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, when we get into, that's, well, we'll talk about that later. Um, in physics, we deal with, let's see if I can remember it off the top of my head, 1.9 times 10 to the negative 19th. Anyway, and joules constant, something times 10 to the negative 34th. So that, that exponent can be anything, and it's going to range. But this can only be one number, one digit between one and nine. This is the, here's where the pothole comes in. You do a problem and you get as your answer 12.30 times 10 to the second. And you write it down. It's wrong. When we're talking about scientific notation, that is not correct scientific notation. If you were told to put the answer in correct scientific notation, that is not. So you have to move the decimal. And this is the pothole. This is where people screw up. They don't screw up putting a raw number into scientific notation or taking it back out. But they do screw up if they get a number that's in scientific notation but it's not correct scientific notation and they have to move the decimal. And you have to ask yourself, am I adding to this number or subtracting from it? Oh. Now it's really easy with this one. It's easy. But it's good to start off with a model of what you do with an easy problem and then go to the harder one. Because my little pea brain can't handle left and right, and so I can't, I just can't handle moving the decimal and just counting places and adding or subtracting. I actually do this on my paper. If you look at any single paper, any paper I've done that uses scientific notation, you will see this. Let's see. Well, I'm going to go one, two, and that would fluff the number back out. And then I'm going to go one, two, three. Oh, okay, this is 1.230 times 10 to the third. I knew my exponent was going to be one number different. I knew I only needed to move my decimal one place. But I can never remember for the life of me, and I apologize, I cannot clearly explain with left and right. <laughs> the addition and subtraction. So I do this little under to fluff it out, over to put it back where it's supposed to be. Let's do that with a crazy number. 
Um, ba -da -da -da. Point zero seven. No, let's make it even worse. Point zero. Well, ten to the negative second. Okay, that's just a, a little flick. Okay, so I got this as an answer to a problem. What do I do? Well, what I do is I put a bunch of fake zeros out here. And I say, well, negative second. One, two. One, two, three, four, five. Three point seven times ten to the negative fifth. There are easier ways to do this, I am sure. If you come up with one, teach me. Seriously. If you have a beautiful, simple, elegant solution to this that does not require the use of left and right, teach me. But in eight years of chemistry, this is the best way I have come up with to not screw up my answers. Am I telling you you have to do it this way? No, I'm not. You may have a powerful brain capable of moving decimals in a single bound. But if you find that you are screwing up moving decimals when you get funky numbers and have to move them around, might I suggest my little pea-brained hack here? Because it does work. It ain't pretty, but it does work. Okay, now, let's look at why on earth we would end up needing this little pea-brained hack. And to do that, we have to talk about doing operations that involve scientific notation. Okay. There are two basic sets of rules. There's one, there's one rule for addition and subtraction. We don't deal with addition and subtraction of scientific notation a lot in chemistry. We're mostly dealing with um, multiplication and division. But when we are adding or subtracting, the exponents have to match. And we can demo why that is really quickly. So, if I have these numbers and I'm attempting to add them, what numbers am I really adding? Can I add 2.3 plus 1.5? No, because at that point what I'm adding is 230 and 1500. The decimal places are all off. So I somehow have to get these things into the same order of magnitude. I have to get them down to the same power of 10. That doesn't work. So to do that, and I tend to go when the exponents are positive, I tend to go for the larger exponent. When they're negative, I tend to go for the smaller exponent. But you can do it either way. That's really important to understand. You can do this either way. So if I'm going to put this, whoops. If I'm going to put this in, in 10 to the third, 2.3 times 10 to the second, well, 2.3, and I'm going to put all my zeros out here. If that was 1, 2, whoops, I didn't do it in red. 1, 2, then coming back, let me shrink that tip just a little bit. 1, 2, 3. So this would be 0.23 times 10 to the third. Now, Moser, you just said you can't do that. It's not correct scientific notation. It's okay when you're adding and subtracting. This is a momentary intermediate step. You can have something that's not in correct scientific notation while you're in the process. Now, what this allows you to do is say, well, 1.5 plus 0.23 gives me 1.73, and the whole thing is going to be times 10 to the third. Okay, Does that seem familiar to you? How many of you have done this recently in math, in the last year? Been a while. Okay, Is this something you learned in Algebra 1? Okay, So it has been a while for all of you. Um, as I said, the addition and subtraction isn't as useful here but you do need to know how to do it. Do you want to do one with a negative exponent? Yay or nay? Yay? Okay. 
Okay, so I've got 5.20 times 10 to the negative third, 7.50 times 10 to the negative fourth. Probably easiest if we get everything into negative third. So I'm going to set that one aside. 7, 5, 0. I'm going to put some imaginary zeros out in front. And I know this is to the negative fourth. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3. So I have 0 0.750 times 10 to the negative third. Now it's a pretty easy addition. Okay. I see that time is running short. Um, However, we aren't done yet. Have a good day, folks. I'll see you in a week.